The title of this talk is Positive Action Method or Methodology. Now, as a Norsean concept, positive action has traditionally been understood to be a method, a political method employed almost reactively as a response to the encroachment of modernity. So, this paper is, is an exploratory paper. Um, it's not an academic paper as such. Too, too close? Is that okay? Yeah. It's not an academic paper. It's not an academic paper as such. It's an exploration of thoughts. It's too close. Um, it's it's an exploration of thoughts and ideas. It's not an um, an academic paper. So positive action. One thing that has to be clarified right from the beginning is that Nurse's positive action is not to be confused with the late 20th century orthodoxy known as positive thinking. Um, if you go to the UK and you visit any bookshop, I don't know about Bangladesh, but if you go to the UK and you visit a bookshop, you will find shelf after shelf of self-help books. Books written by so-called experts that help you to do lots and lots of things in your life that they think that you should be doing. Um, all of them advocate this idea of positive thinking. Think positively. We're told all the time, think positively. The writer Karen Armstrong tells the story of a man that she met at a conference. And this man went up to her and said, if you have true faith, you, you can't suffer. Um, now, to an extent, I understand where that sentiment comes from, but I still can't help but feel that that is the lazy way out. Um, faith should not be an opiate. As Marx very perspectively said, the opium of the people. Um, but to hear some people talk, faith is seen as something that would numb even the pains of a whole concentration camp. We are told, think positively and everything will be fine. And I don't think that is really the case. And in any case, the Islamic faith in particular, isn't it supposed to make us see the world as it really is? Now, this positive thinking message becomes particularly toxic when it is used by governments as a kind of anesthetic, the anesthesia of positivity, alongside all of the other forms of social control which um, are employed to keep people in this state of drugged insensibility to what is really going on in the world out there. A kind of matrix, if you will, as Professor Farid said. But in our global world, which can be accessed at the press, at the press of a social media button, we can no longer afford to censor the voices of the oppressed, or as Karen Armstrong put it, to edit out the uncomfortable spectacle of human misery. In past, my own government has pursued policies that have resulted in great suffering. I'm not here to apologize, by the way, um, because it wasn't me. Telling us that we need to think positively and ultimately everything will be well. And we in the West have let conflicts continue until they have become humanitarian disasters. Today we are reaping the, um, the reward of our heedlessness as the pain which exists in many parts of the world has turned into murderous, terroristic rage. So I wanted just to separate the, the Western social orthodoxy, if you like, of positive thinking from the Norsean notion of positive action, because they're very, very different things. So what does it mean to say positive action? What does it mean when we say an action is positive? Well, if we consider the conceptual framework with within which this term has evolved, that is the framework of the risale nur we see that it is a framework of worshipfulness. So the first key word is worshipfulness, ubudiya. It means acting in accordance with the precepts of divine wisdom and not on the basis of emotion or personal desire. In other words, it is informed action. That's the second thing, informed action. It also means acting for the sake of the creator and not for the sake of the self. In other words, it means directed action. So we have three things so far. 
ubudia, worshipfulness, informed action, directed action. And it also means acting in accordance with the principles of the Quran rather than any other kind of directive. In other words, it is grounded action. Positive action then means acting in a way that is informed by divine wisdom, grounded in the principles of the Quran and directed towards deepening our sense of communion with the Creator. Nothing is done for his sake, actually. It's all done for our own sake, because the Creator doesn't need anything from us. We, on the other hand, need everything from him. And positive action means acknowledging our own need and expressing that need through everything we do, say, think, and so on. So we can see, therefore, that positive action isn't a method as most people have portrayed it. When they look at Nursi's positive action, most writers have portrayed it as a method. I don't think it's a method, it's a methodology. Um, now there's a difference between a method and a methodology. And the social scientists here will know, hopefully, what that difference is. A method is a single tool. A methodology is the whole toolkit, to put it um, very crudely. Now, traditionally, positive action in the Norsian context has been linked specifically with the issue of metaphorical jihad, what he calls manavi jihad, jihad manavi. However, I see positivity in most if not all of the concepts and the views and the approaches which are visible in the Risale. I see positive thinking throughout Nursi's work. It's not a tool, it's not a method, it's a toolkit, it's a methodology. So let me elaborate. Man is a meaning-making being. And we are given innately as human beings to hermeneutical thinking. Language is the tool that we use to allow us to think and to communicate symbolically. It allows us to read, it allows us to interpret. <clears throat> when the prophet was told to Ithra in the very first revelation, when the prophet was told to Ithra, I understand it as signifying the fact that he was told to interpret. Not just to read, but to interpret. To be born into this world is to be born into a plethora of signs and symbols. We live in a symbolic world. And these signs and symbols have to be interpreted. They have to be made sense of. Those who are unable to make sense of the world in which they are living are doomed to live a life either of alienation or of abject cognitive confusion and intellectual servitude. In other words, we all read the creation. And how we live depends on how we interpret how we read the creation. Now, to escape the fate of abject cognitive confusion and intellectual servitude depends on whether we are willing to think ontologically, which is what the very first revelation to the prophet was all about. Now, for the vast majority of people, ontological thinking is not something that is deemed worthy of consideration, at least not to any great degree. Professor Farid was talking about existential angst. Now, existential angst exists, if at all, as a juvenile phase, usually, in the West. It starts out as a juvenile phase, usually the endless questions posed by the growing child are usually either ignored or subverted. Um, you can go in, into a supermarket or into a shop and you can hear a child asking his mother for something or asking a question. Um, and you hear mothers and fathers telling their children, stop asking so many questions. Um, so we are not used to ontological thinking. We have it more or less talked out of us as youngsters. The secular education system, and I'm not nearly so generous towards secularism as Professor Farid is, um, the secular education system, and don't think the education here is not secular because obviously it is, serves to answer the questions in accordance with the dominant social narrative. 
and the default setting of modernity is secularity and naturalism slash scientific materialism. That is the default setting of modernity, of secular modernity. Now, the vast masses of the largely unthinking, unregenerate, don't know what they believe until they're told what they believe. Their faith is in science, or rather in scientism, and in scientific and technological progress. And I'm talking mostly about my own context here. But I think it also applies to a certain extent all over the world, actually. Those who find themselves hungry for something over and above the simple staple fare of secular materialism are ushered towards the increasingly non-conformist religion of spirituality without religion. People talk all the time in the West of how they're not religious, that they're spiritual. So most people don't think, and those who do think, are sort of pushed towards these new age religions, these new age spiritualist trends. And when they get there, they're able to explore their innate and inexplicable desire for transcendence by tasting and testing various expressions of faith. Others gravitate towards one of the highly secularized world religions, Christianity, Judaism and Islam. And if they end up as Muslims, their Islam is highly secularized. Our Islam today is highly secularized. And that's not just because we live in secular societies. There are other historical reasons for why Islam has become secularized. Um, it is becoming a personal, private religion that stops when we leave the house in the morning. Now, we know that the Quran prizes ontological thinking very highly because there are numerous verses in which we are exhorted to reason, to reflect, and to deliberate. Tafakkur, tadabbur, ta'aqul. No other religious tradition that I know of places such a high value on, on reasoning, on deliberating, on reflecting, and on imagination indeed. Now, it is from ontology how we understand the world, what we understand the world to be, that epistemology emerges. And from epistemology, we derive a moral system upon, we, upon which we determine and regulate our behaviors as believers. So we're talking here about ontology, how we understand the world to be, what, the under, what we understand the world to be, epistemology, how we understand it, what is the medium through which we understand it, morality, how do we behave, and action, what do we do. It's on these four precepts, on these four poles, that a Muslim believer's life, both in this world and in the next, is built. Now, Said Nursi paints a very simple picture of the epistemological choices which are open to man. We have two choices. Before us lie two paths, each belonging to a particular line. <coughs> Nursi calls one of these lines the line of philosophy, which derives knowledge and meaning from the world by means of the use of reason. But by means of the use of reason alone. The other is the line of prophethood, which derives knowledge and meaning about the world from revelation, aided by reason. So there is a difference. Two lines. Line of philosophy, line of prophethood. Now, for the unregenerate, morality is arrived at by use of reason guided by social and personal interest. So someone who is not a believer derives their morality from two things, personal interest and social influence. Secular morality takes from revelation only those things that are of social and personal utility, because secular morality is instrumentalist, consequentialist, and it is, of course, geared towards the attainment of personal growth uh, sorry, personal benefit and social benefit, whether or not revelation is in agreement with it. When we come to behaviours, behaviours are determined and regulated by morality. 
which is largely in the secular West laissez-faire. Anything goes. As time progresses, the dependence of behaviors on the moral system is overturned, as increasingly behavior itself starts to determine morality. And this is only something very, very recent. Moral codes are broken openly, and eventually morality is molded in accordance with the behaviors which have been sanctioned by the, by the majority. Um, a very good example recently um, in the West, and possibly it will be coming here as well, is the issue of homosexual acts between consenting adults, another is same-sex marriage. And it's arguably, and I'm not in particular arguing the case, but it has been argued, that a sign of the breakdown of morality occurs when behaviors, instead of being determined by the moral system, actually act as determinants of the moral system. So whereas a Muslim believer would argue that they get their behaviors from their morality, in the West it's starting to be overturned, and now we get our morality from behaviors. So it's been inverted. Now it is clear that this kind of outlook, this what I call the unregenerate system, is predicated on negativity. And one only has to look at the ontological basis of modernity to understand it. Because this is the realm of Adam, or non-existence. And I agree to, to a large extent with, with Professor Farid that the, um, the big problem for us today is, is nihilism. And there are vast swathes of Western civilizational output um, which are actually based on, on this, this notion of non-existence or Adam. Nursi talks with a great insight about the key drivers of unbelief. One is what he calls Adam.